The title is It's Time to Cross the Rubicon and Battle Our 20th Century Refuge. Rubicon was a small river that divided the Roman territory of Italy from that of Gaul. Italy was cr controlled by a fellow named Pompey, who was a military leader in the Roman province of Italy. Gaul was controlled by Julius Caesar. Pompey got nervous about Caesar's expanding his, uh, his empire. So around 51 BC, during a time of peace, Pompey proposed to Caesar that since his, old, his army is no longer needed, it should be disbanded and Caesar would be demoted as the governor of all the provinces outside of Gaul. Now that, that would be sort of like the Grand Master of Texas telling the Grand Master of Oklahoma that since Oklahoma is just an outlying province of Texas, you know, we should give up our, our jurisdiction to the, in favor of Texas. Well, that would never work because everyone knows you can't outlie a Texan. But, you know, I digress. That's my part of the country. Huh? Anyway, Caesar's response was to form an army on the banks of the, of the River Rubicon to take over the province of Italy for himself. And as the story has it, just before he ordered the Rubicon to be crossed, he realized how great an enterprise he was undertaking. He paused and he turned to his men in his immediate vicinity and he said, and yet friends, we are still able to turn back. But once we pass over this little bridge, there will be no business but by force of arms and dint of sword. By crossing the river, this famous act, now enshrined in the catchphrase to, ca to uh, cross the Rubicon, came to stand for the making of a momentous decision. It means that it is a decision for which there's no turning back. Caesar gave his men a choice, and they chose to follow his leadership. His decision literally meant death or success to him and all his friends. He had at hand an army of 5,000, and he only had 10,000 ruffians to overcome, the army of Pompey, and he was victorious. Now, I recount this story to engage your thinking about its parallel with where we are in masonry today. When we encounter a bridge in our Masonic rituals, they all mean the same thing we are moving from one point of an awareness to another. We are overcoming and transcending an old frame of mind that no longer works and leaving it in the past of our experience. And we are creating another which enables us to go forward, to move, to do, to think, and to act in a wiser and in more enlightened way. Now, I join with a number of Masonic thinkers that I know and respect who believe that American Freemasonry may be at a bridge or a point of crossing in this moment of our organizational history. And we're concerned that if we don't cross the Rubicon and start doing battle with ourselves, that is, our organizational paradigms that are now harming us, we may end up just a tiny, tiny cabal of old men who offer no significance to both masonry and the outside world. You see, our American Grand Lodges are literally standing at a threshold between a renaissance and the demise of our fraternity at this point in our history. And the first ruffian we must encounter is that the bulk of our Masonic leaders and lodges are currently unaware of the profound significance of this moment. Yet if they would undertake a statistical analysis of the real condition of our grand jurisdictions, they would come to the reality 
that if we don't make some substantive changes soon, Freemasonry will be in 15 to 20 years where the Oddfellas are today. How many Oddfellas do you know? You know, there's a few Oddfellow Lodges still around, but there's so few, and they're in so few communities that they're totally irrelevant. They cannot overcome themselves. They cannot recreate themselves. So yeah, 15, 20 years from now, we'll still have a few lodges, but too few to enable us to recreate ourselves as an organization. So the choice we make is grand lodges and lodges over the next several years. And I'm talking about the years before the end of this decade may determine whether or not Freemasonry will thrive or die within the next 30 years. Now that's a phenomenon that exists only in North American Freemasonry. All other Freemasonry in the world is growing today. Now that says volumes about the difference between the way they think about things and the way that we have done things in, you know, in, in, during the last 80 years. So we live in a time, my brothers, where it is exceedingly difficult for people to find authenticity in their lives. But authenticity is also tied to perception. The central question for our organization today is how does Freemasonry render authenticity? Young men entering our fraternity today, as you know, often know far more about Masonry than we do. They've already arrived at their own conclusions that Freemasonry is a venue for truth-seeking, a vehicle for self-development, a quest for the spiritual. There are secret associations to be discovered there. So men are coming into our order with these kinds of perceptions about us. And so we must ask ourselves if the real experience they will find in Lodge is compatible with their expectations of us. And we all know that too often it is not. And when we have a disconnect with our new brothers, its best chance of being reconciled is not to force them into compliance with our way of thinking. Because most of us, for most of us, our way of thinking is tied only to the period in which we have lived. And his perception of what is authentic in masonry is quite different from the actual Masonic experience you and I have had. And I suggest that the solution to this conundrum can be found by working it out together while focusing on masonry's traditional ways of doing things in the 18th and 19th centuries. After all, that was our model of success for 200 years. So a second ruffian we face is the mediocrity we have brought into the practice of our craft over the past 80 years. And one reason we have become so passive in our approach to Freemasonry is because 20th century Masons were, taught, were not taught the purpose of, the reason for, and profound experience a profound significance of the initiatic experience. They have not focused on how masonry actually informs the transformation of the individual. In masonry, the central point where authenticity enters our lexicon comes from a line in Shakespeare's play Hamlet. There is a point in Hamlet where the character Polinius says something profoundly real. At the end of a laundry list of advice Polinius is giving to his son Leritus, he says this, And this above all else, to thine own self be true. And it dost this follow as night to day, that thou canst not then be false to any man. And to me, this verse shouts at the very heart of Masonic authenticity. Know thyself is the clarion call 
of Masonic thinking, teaching. And we all know that the journey through the degrees of Freemasonry represents each man's journey of his own life, wherein he's, wherein he's supposed to grow in the discovery of who he is, what has meaning to him, how he can overcome himself, and what will bring him fulfillment as a man. So if we can agree with this premise, there are two dimensions of authenticity which we can communicate to our brothers. The first is, be true to yourself. And the second is, be what you say you are to others. <clears throat> what Mason would not agree that this is at the very heart of Masonic truth? And perhaps an important corollary here to, the po to, to point out is, if you are not what you say you are, then you are fake. So how does this apply to the Lodge experience? We say we take good men and make them better, but we have to validate this claim to our new initiate. Each man has to ask himself from time to time the degree of honesty in which his Lodge is embracing Freemasonry's real purpose. Do I, as an individual, personally and sincerely believe with all my heart that how my lodge approaches the study, understanding, and practice of, mas of masonry intellectually, spiritually, and psychologically, and philosophically is truly authentic to the Masonic heritage from which we came? Does my perception of true masonry get exemplified through my lodge experience? Does it resonate in a way that masonry's hope for my transportation feels real to me when we come together in our lodge uh, setting month after month? Does my lodge actually facilitate my becoming transformed by my experience as a man and a mason? These are heavy questions. And these are questions every lodge should be thrown out in discussions, you know, to think about in terms of the experience they're offering. Well, I don't know the answers to this kind of a query for anybody except myself. I can only be true to myself. I can only offer my experience and what authenticity felt like to me. I can communicate two aspects of authenticity that are in my judgment critical to the future of Freemasonry. And I think that you will find that both tie directly to our traditional purpose of improving men. To illustrate the first essential of Masonic authenticity, I will share something of my own experience. I'm the son of a Mason. My father was an active Freemason, and so was his brother, my uncle. They were both farmers and ranchers in northwest Oklahoma. Matter of fact, we had adjoining farms. For as long as I can remember, my father would come in from his work every Wednesday afternoon. He would take a bath. He would put on his Sunday suit. And my uncle would, and he would slap on Old Spice deodorant. <laughs> and my uncle would come by and pick him up and they would go to lodge. And they did this for 50 years. I cannot remember a time when I was not going to be a Freemason. I also knew the men in the little community that was the closest, the place that we, that we farmed. It was a place of only 2,500 population. It was where we celebrated the festivals of our lives. We went to church and we had our social conversations outside of our home. I knew the most respected men in that little town over my, over my childhood. They would meet me on the sidewalk. When we were at festivals and places like that, they would always come up and shake my hand and ask me how I was doing. I can't remember when I did not know them. I took the degrees of masonry during the summer of my 21st year. And when I arrived, 
for my entered apprentice degree, all these men I had known and respected in my childhood were there. They were my father's friends. And I can remember to this day standing in the preparation room, duly prepared, waiting for someone to return my knocks on the door and thinking to myself, tonight I'm going to be initiated into manhood. There was absolutely no question in my mind. I wanted to grow up to be like those men. I wanted to know what integrity looked like and they were my exemplars. And I expected them to facilitate my growth into manhood. You see how significant that is? For us who are elders of the tribe, that's our role. That's our role for the young men coming into our fraternity. And so I believe this to be the first essential of an authentic Masonic experience. We have to understand that our organizational purpose is to facilitate each man's journey to mature masculinity. And it's fundamental to a man's understanding of his own process of growth. Freemasonry is first and foremost an initiatic society with the calling to respond to the psychological need in men to be initiated into manhood. And the initiatic experience is meant to convey one of the most, power, the most powerful idea to the person being initiated. He has left one stage of his life, one phase of his life, and he's entering upon another. He is putting away an old life and he's taking on another. Initiation, my brothers, is by definition a conferral of a different status on the individual. It is a change in his consciousness which results in some form of rebirth or renewal within the deepest aspect of his nature. That is the meaning of the raising of Hiram. In a men's house, being initiated means that the initiate is consciously aware he has entered onto a path toward mature masculinity. And the journey begins with this awareness. He has to know what doing the right thing means as a man. His perceptions and enforcement of responsibility must come from within himself. He has to be consciously present with the deepest aspect of his being. And mature masculinity also has an exoteric dimension, which is equally important to authenticity. We must also be consciously aware of how we represent ourselves to others. Truthfulness, goodness, honor, honesty, courage, purity, by whatever name we give them, our values define us because they also define for the outside world who we are. How we integrate these ideals, convictions, beliefs, and behaviors out in the world will determine our social status, will determine our integrity in the eyes of those people who know us. It will determine our social honor in the way we do things. It will determine whether or not we are seen by people in the outside world as men of integrity as important men, as men one can rely upon, as men who distinguish themselves from the rest of the community. You see, a man's integrity is clearly within himself, to himself, and for himself what it is to others. And this is why it is so important that a man be aware of his dignity at all times. Above all else, a specific style of life should be expected from those who wish to belong to our inner circle and wear the title of Master Mason. And that style of life, my brethren, is built and founded upon integrity. The function of Masonic ritual and the Masonic bonding it facilitates for us 
is no less than a, than a dramatic construct for social improvement. And when you think about this, when a king is consecrated, when a student is given a doctorate, when a groom is married, when a man is initiated and entered apprentice, or a worshipful master is installed to preside, they acquire a different social role which they did not have before. In every honor which bestows upon us new status, we must leave a less worthy state and raise ourselves to a higher state of awareness and duty and grace. The path to enlightenment, social honor, and status is always an upward way. And through our organization, we are about the business of communicating and sustaining integrity and grace in the life of our members. If we do any less, we stop short of fulfilling our promise that we improve ourselves in masonry because personal improvement implies moving to a higher state of personal integrity. Freemasonry exists first and foremost to transform men. And this transformation takes place because one is initiated into a fellowship of men, the right kind of men. We have everything required to make this process work. We come from a legal founding. We have the longest history of any male society in the world. We have a lasting legacy of worthiness. And we offer a sense of stability and moral authority that can be respected and passed along to succeeding generations. And the wonderful thing about this scenario is that all of this can occur within the sacred and social space of the Lodge. It is not dependent upon the success of any hierarchy above it. It's all about what brand each Lodge chooses to adopt for itself and the integrity portrayed by the men in it. So our collective purpose is to grow together in social honor. And these are the compelling reasons for men, especially young men, to join us today. Most men are isolated, both individually and in groups, in occupations and feelings. Many of our young men come from divorced parents. They seek a, com a common identity with other men. They yearn to share a portion of their lives with other men. They want to be on the journey to self-development and personal improvement. They want patriarchy and role modeling to guide them to mature and manly judgment. They seek truth. They want to be nurtured. They covet brotherhood. They seek meaning in their lives. They want to learn about values. They want to know what real integrity looks like. They want to follow through on their values with personal action so that they too can become men with social honor. They are interested in how men are connected, how relationships can have meaning across generations. They want to know why they are here and what will bring them fulfillment. And it is this cross-section of society of men we want to look for, cultivate, and have as brothers among us. The Lodge and the men in it have always been the receptacle in which these needs are discovered and accommodated. You see, the challenge today of Freemasonry is not that we don't own the right product. Our challenge is that not enough of our members are representing themselves as men with social honor who are engaged in personally participating in the teaching and mentoring of men, of making, yes, of making men out of guys. Think about that. We're all guys when we get out of high school. We're all guys until we're probably 30, 35 years old. At some point in time, we have to make the conversion to manhood. And there's a big difference between being a guy and a man, and we facilitate that transformation. So, they were interested in making 
men out of guys so that they one day become the next generation of elders, they still can be carrying the torch of manhood and honor to the young men joining in their own time, in their lives. So our job is to produce men who will have honor and integrity in their own time by the witness of our example today. Our responsibility is to raise the next generation of men below us in such a way that all men and women who come to know them during their lives will think to themselves and say to each other, there goes a wonderful man. Isn't that a wonderful feeling to have when somebody says that about you? You just can't beat it anywhere. The fraternal movement exists to play out this role in the overall scheme of things. This remarkable purpose of making wonderful and extraordinary men out of good guys. We need only to guide the collective consciousness within our lodge along a particular spiritual path that literally transforms and improves each of us. And that is the path to the Masonic Renaissance. If we're going to see a Masonic Renaissance, this is the path we're going to have to take. Because we have to distinguish ourselves from the rest of the community. There's too much competition out there. If we do any less, they'll never see us. You know, it's just it's that critically important. <clears throat> I also know what is not real to me. I do not believe that masonry is being true to, to itself when it permits a complete stranger to enter into the path of the ancient mysteries under the sole assumption that every seemingly good man is a fit for Freemasonry. Twentieth century American Freemasonry is the only Freemasonry in the world that ever adopted that model. That Freemasonry was for every man. I sometimes wonder if it is authentic for Freemasonry to be concerned about its public image when it declares to itself that its work is about the internal and not the eternal nature of the human condition. I do not believe that masonry is being served when lodges simply go through the motions of being part of a fraternity in name only without offering their members a quality fraternal experience or understanding the significance of what they teach or do. You see, they create a Masonic experience that is kind of a real fake thing. In a real sense, they offer a pretend experience. Make sense? A lodge which informs every entered apprentice that through masonry he is to become a living and thinking actor filled with moral and intellectual light while never creating a sacred space within its tiled setting that is so solemn, so unique, and so eccentric that its members cannot experience it anywhere else in their lives without performing its degree work with impeccable accuracy, clarity, and deep meaning, without regularly teaching and discussing its symbolism and allegories, without delivering lectures and sharing dialogue, which focuses on revealing the transformative nature of Masonry's intent for the man and his world, without regularly meditating together on the nature of the divine within us, and how we can access this power for right purpose and action is not being real to our fraternity's traditional vision. Again, our ruffian is that we are offering only a real fake authenticity. Now, of course, it can be argued that what is real and authentic in my Masonic experience is not authentic for everyone. For some people, obtaining the three degrees and coming back for their 50-year pin is authentic. For others, coming to meetings, opening lodge, paying bills, listening to the minutes, closing, and eating stale cookies is authentic. And for still others, being in a lodge that is me mediocre in every feature of its experience is authentic. 
But my brothers, it is only a real fake authenticity. This never was authentic Freemasonry. It just wasn't. Yeah. The systemic problem in our practice of Freemasonry is that for each of us here today, our traditions in Masonry have been only what we have experienced in our own lifetime. And in reality, perhaps we were too passive in being content just to sustain a particular brand of masonry that was offered to our World War II era men who were looking for a specific kind of Masonic experience that just happened to be their kind of experience. It was an experience built solely on fraternalism, comradeship, and stability. They were looking for normalcy again. And it may have worked for them. But my guy, 63 consecutive years of decline has surely taught us that it is not the right masonry for our generation. Whatever their model was, it is clearly the wrong brand for today. We're still being, we're still being driven by dead men. You know, we've got to get beyond that. So today and in the future and in more and more lodges, we will have to provide a place where our new brothers can have their expectations met, who can genuinely have an experience that is authentic to them because it's also authentic to Freemasonry. And the bottom line of Masonic teaching is that through the journey of our degrees, we learn that the attainment of mature masculinity is work and the divine truth cannot be understood by the human agencies of education or dogma or rational thought or by the evidence of the senses, uh, senses. It has to be perceived directly. And my brethren, it enters us through the path of authentic initiation. And if such awareness and insight and understanding can happen in a lodge room, then the influence of an improved mind, a better human, can also be felt outside of it. Men come into masonry to learn to improve themselves. And if they're coming here for any other reason, then they're failing to represent with honesty what our organizational purpose is. And if you're not on the same path with our organizational purpose, then you are creating only a fake, real authenticity. And that's not good enough for a man who wishes to distinguish himself from the rest of the community. It's just that simple. When we as Freemasons tell a man to be a man, we mean there is a way to be a man. A man is not just a thing to be, it's also a way to be, a path to follow, and a way to walk. Being good at being a man has to mean something. A man is not merely a man, but a man among men in a world of men. The bottom line is that when we tell a man to be a man, we are telling him to be a man whom other men can hold in high regard. A man who knows who he is because he has integrated his outer consciousness with his mature masculine soul, the divine nature of his very being. And because he has been initiated into a particular group who has a strong sense of its own identity, an identity organized around the ways of virtue, by the way, about being a good person, a good citizen, a good role model, a good father, a good member of society, the archetypal virtues directly related to manhood, then there exists a harmony that transcends all outside interests of the group. There's a mutual understanding of the value of that particular social unit. And there's an understanding of what men most often needed from each other and what they're supposed to be doing with their life that will shape their mature masculinity, their masculine psychology. And such men are indeed men among men. But again, there's more questions we must ask ourselves. Do we follow the path of our mythic hero Hiram in our own lives. As we face our challenges and move from one point to life and another to another, 
from child to teenager, from teen to adult, from adult to maturity, from old age to death? Do we actually integrate the hero's journey into our very own? Do our own challenges open doors to knowledge and understanding? Do we prepare ourselves to face difficulties and use our experiences to become stronger and more capable men? Do we achieve wisdom, strength, and beauty, that is, growth, independence, and harmony, as we make our own journey? Do we become the men we want to be? Do we move from the impetuosity of youth to mature and manly judgment? Have we truly become initiated men? Are we truly worthy of discovering the secrets contained within our fraternity? The admission of each, each man into the Masonic order then is a symbolic representation of the beginning of his journey to personal and social honor, of divesting himself of the passions, prejudices, vices, and chaos of the profane world, investing himself with those qualities essential for living the kind of life that will distinguish him from the rest of the community. The way of the craftsman, my brother, is to build a temple to God. I believe it was Kirk McNulty that said this. It is his edifice of consciousness in which he's the architect, the builder, and the building stone. He begins as a rough ashler, and in time he will square his stone, he will make it smooth, he will place it in the temple. And when that temple is complete, God will behold God in the mirror of its existence, and then there will be, as there was in the beginning, only God. Every lodge must to create a brand of Freemasonry that is the real, real for that lodge. That is our collective fraternal engagement here. Let us always enjoy it with the deepest of fellow feeling, but let us make our lodge a good fit only for men who are like unto us. My brothers, we only need to cross the Rubicon. And that's my talk.